Yeah, let's see if that first video works for everybody. I, I did it. Cool if it will work. I didn't see a video in there. Was there a video? There is the first one. Oh, see what I don't think that that transferred over, Mike. Was this a video? Oh, That's it. See if that'll play. No, I don't think it will. You have to do something like uh, just swipe the screen or something like that. You know what? You just because, try I, that. because I transferred these slides over onto mine, I don't think that transferred and I didn't realize that was a video. So I guess you'll have to tell us about that. Well, um, I, what I'd really like to do is someday show you all that, where that picture is taken. It's actually a video and uh, don't feel bad. It hasn't worked for two other presentations either. I can't seem to figure that out. But uh, uh, this photograph was taken in El Rosario, uh, a bit south of Morelia and west of Mexico City. This is one of the three major overwintering sites of the monarch butterfly. Uh, and what you're seeing there in all of that orange color are the monarchs that are, uh, it's basically a sea of monarch butterflies. Uh, and this is a, in my view, having been fortunate to uh, travel the world and seeing lots of things, including uh, the uh, migration of the wildebeest in East Africa. I put this particular uh, biological phenomenon right on the top of one of the most spectacular and most beautiful things I've had a chance to see. So there's millions and millions of monarch butterflies. Uh, so uh, Jeanette, I'll just say next when I want you to go to the next slide. Great. So let's go to All right, I'll quickly tell you, I want to keep this fairly short, uh, talk a little bit about the monarch butterfly, its ecology and the threats. If you don't know, there's a major concern that the monarch will become extinct uh, in the Western US intervention. Uh, we had, uh, last year, we've been working with the monarchs uh, through a small group called Arizona Milkweeds for Monarchs. And last year we became a 501c3 nonprofit. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll talk about the, uh, picking the right milkweed and how to grow it. And finally end up talking about our, uh, the VOC community garden vision. So next. Uh, first, this migration is one of the very interesting characteristics of the monarch butterfly. It migrates from central Mexico, and it winters there, and goes uh, in the spring. Soon it'll be leaving Mexico, uh, goes to Texas and the southern states, has a generation, then goes up to the Midwest, has a generation or two, then comes back and does the same thing. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what happens in Arizona uh, separately. Next. Uh, <clears throat> the reason we are called milkweeds for monarchs is because the milkweeds are the only host plant for monarchs. <laughs> uh, the caterpillars require it and <clears throat> the plants that, are, that the milkweed use are pollinated by bees, wasps, and butterflies. And the monarchs need both their host plants, which is most limiting, nectar plants and uh, pollen plants. All of these are necessary. Next. Uh, there are more than 40 species of milkweeds that are native to Arizona. We are second in biodiversity only to Texas. In the United States, there's roughly 100 species. And so we have nearly half the species that exist in the US. Uh, it's pretty remarkable when you think about it. These check marks, if you look at this list, all of those check marks are species that we have successfully grown and are attempting to propagate. Uh, we're finding some of these species are very easy to grow and uh, make wonderful components to landscape. Others are much more challenging. <laughs> some of these milkweeds take two or three years to get well established. 
So we're trying to work our way through all of the milkweeds uh, to find those that are most suitable uh, so that we can produce them in large quantities, get them into communities, get them into gardens so that the monarchs have at least a chance uh, of recovering uh, from its current decline. Next. Uh, milkweeds, all, essentially all milkweeds are typically perennial. In other words, one plant lives for several years. Some spread by seeds and some spread by underground roots. <clears throat> so they have different mechanisms of distribution. A perennial milkweed, we have some perennial milkweeds that we grow as annuals. Uh, so you can grow uh, a lot of milkweeds here in our Verde Valley and Sedona area, uh, either as annuals or as uh, perennials. <clears throat> they are a uh, highly diverse group, ranging in height from as little as six inches to as much as six feet. <clears throat> uh, we find them growing in deserts, prairies, wetlands, forest canyons, along roadsides and in agricultural fields and pastures. So they occur in a lot of different habitats. Uh, in Flagstaff, uh, where we are, most of our work has been so far, uh, the milkweed species flower between August and October. Uh, and in the Verde Valley here, we, uh, I'm pretty close to having my first milkweed flower. <coughs> so that means it's actually earlier than it says on this slide. So it's as early as April and going well into November. Hmm. <clears throat> this flowering time is really very important because of this slide here. If you look at the that blue box there, that's Arizona. And I told you a little bit about the migration story east of the Rockies. But in Arizona, we have a little bit more complex of a situation. And what we know, number one is, is that there are very few good, uh, th there's very little good experimental data to tell us exactly what's going on with the migrations. But we do know that there are butterflies which have come from overwintering in Mexico to Arizona. And then we also have uh, butterflies in the valley in uh, Phoenix where there are some uh, uh, overwintering populations or continuous populations uh, that um, are there during the winter time. And then they begin, those two sources, we don't know exactly whether they come at the same time, but those two sources begin to migrate north. Uh, the information we got just a couple of days ago is that when the, the monarchs in Phoenix are getting uh, anxious to head north, and so they, the butterflies are beginning to leave the Phoenix area are, and help and hopefully headed our way. Uh, they can have a generation in Arizona. Uh, there is a place very near to the, uh, uh, the VOC community garden uh, where I have seen for three consecutive years uh, a uh, generation of monarch butterflies occurring on one of the species of milkweed we have. Unfortunately, that site one year ago was destroyed. It was a roadside site and uh, construction <clears throat> um, took most of the plants out. But uh, this year, we're hoping that the butterflies will come looking for their, uh, their usual place and find our garden as a place to uh, have a generation to lay eggs and uh, produce <coughs> monarch adults. Uh, from the spring population in our area, if we have suitable habitat, they'll have a generation and then they will head to, we believe either California or further north. And I think we have records for both of those happening. You probably know along the coast of California, there are overwintering populations of monarchs. Uh, those overwintering populations have absolutely been decimated in the last five years or so, and there are very few monarchs that are over along the coastal areas. So what we're doing in Arizona is really critically important because uh, we're not Southern California, we're not overpopulated. We do have the potential of uh, producing enough uh, milkweeds and monarchs to help sustain that population. 
So one of our real uh, <clears throat> holy grails is to see if we can't get a breeding population of monarchs. Next. Next slide, please. <clears throat> One of the big things that has is hampered <clears throat> our ability to, uh, to get milkweeds is that there is relatively few uh, seed sources. Uh, it's difficult to find the plants. They're in low abundance. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, seeds that are available are not uh, adapted to specific areas. So we've taken on that challenge. Uh, we're finding out locations for milkweeds. We're collecting seed from those milkweeds. And we're then trying to propagate them through seed orchards. <clears throat> so there are very few nurseries or catalogs that sell milkweeds. And those that do don't know where those plants come from. So one of the things that we do is we know the location where every one of the sources that we uh, produce have come from. So we can tell you exactly what the environmental conditions are, where they exist. And of course, we try to match that up with the places that we're trying to plant. But we're just beginning. There's a lot of uh, need out there. Uh, we have uh, co-opted with uh, a company called Terwa Seed. Terwa is in uh, uh, Chino Valley, and they currently will sell about 50, they're selling 15 or so species of milkweeds, which we provide them. So all of their seed comes through our, uh, our nonprofit, and uh, we know where all those seeds come from. Uh, unfortunately, we can't produce very many seeds, so we have to sell, we're selling only packet-sized seeds. In other words, 20 seeds or so in a packet, which is not uncommon for the, you know, sort of rarer vegetables and things that you buy from seed companies. So we do have that relationship going, but we simply are not able to provide the seed that's uh, demanded, that is being demanded. Next. Uh, so our milkweed is, our, our, excuse me, our mission is to assess the suitability and utilization of native milkweed species by monarch butterflies in the basically northern Arizona, mid and high elevations. Next. We're trying to increase the abundance of milkweeds. We want to make sure we're going to try and get seeds available, get plants available and determine which native milkweed species perform best at different elevations and different habitats. So we want to be able to say, this milkweed will do well in this location, this one will not. <clears throat> We've done a bunch of things. We've used citizen science and common gardens. Uh, our first project, we, I think we had 20 or so master gardeners and we grew 10 or 12 species at uh, uh, several different locations, Flagstaff, Prescott, uh, the Verde Valley, uh, to, to, to get a sense as to what will grow where. And uh, we have a, a pretty good idea right now what things will do well in what lo locations. And of course, uh, I talked about seed production, that's very important. And now we're gonna begin to look at things like uh, flowering, uh, uh, the use of other plants. Um, one of the critical things is that since I've explained this idea of migrations, the butterflies are going to come through our area fairly soon. And the question is, will we have milkweed plants and will we have flowers uh, that provide nectar and pollen available for these plants? So the phenological synchrony is a huge question. We have some hints, but uh, it's uh, very much a critical need. Next. So here's just a couple of uh, pictures of some of the species. Uh, this slide is for some higher elevations, but this includes 4,000 feet. And uh, there are quite a few interesting uh, milkweeds that we can grow. Uh, we're not recommending all of the 20 species we have in cultivation just yet, but uh, there are definitely milkweeds available for 
uh, gardeners and for conservation efforts and for people who really want to, uh, you know, kind of help the monarch butterfly by planting even just a few plants in your neighborhood uh, can help the population. Next. Next slide, sorry, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'll talk now about our last main topic, which is about the VOC <clears throat> and the community garden program. <clears throat> uh, first off, a garden is many things. There are many things to many different people. It's fresh food, it's exercise, uh, it's a serene place. <clears throat> um, growing up, I grew up in a family that was a, a very much a, a subsistence farming and we used to cut our own wood and heated our house with wood and the saying always was growing up that a good piece of wood warms you twice once when you make it and once when you burn it and so it's the same thing about gardening gardening rewards you twice once when you get the exercise and stretch and work and bend as i was doing this morning and i don't bend as well as i used to uh, but I also was able to uh, harvest some beautiful radish and beautiful uh, lettuce from my garden this morning. So a garden is, uh, is food, exercise, and serenity. A garden can also be a habitat garden <clears throat> uh, where we design the garden so as to help a particular species uh, survive. And it can also be a pollinator garden. <clears throat> we know that pollinators contribute to about a third of our food that we eat. And they are very important. And I like to think of a pollen garden as a twofer. If you put in a monarch habitat garden, uh, as we are doing uh, as part of the community garden effort, uh, you will automatically get a pollinator garden. <clears throat> and in fact, if uh, I think we're finally going to end up with about eight species of native milkweeds in the garden and 22 species of pollinators, uh, pollinator plants. Uh, so uh, you, you will automatically get a pollinator garden if you put in a habitat garden. If you do it the other way around, if you're only trying to support pollinators, you will not, may not contribute to monarchs because monarchs need uh, their food plants. So uh, I like to focus on the butterfly garden idea. And I think, um, I think it was Heather who suggested that, uh, you know, a garden is a special place. It's a good place to gather. It's a good place to escape. Think of that fence of the wall where all that stuff on the outside doesn't, you know, overwhelm your day. Uh, and so a garden is a lot of things. And, uh, I'm very, very supportive of the whole uh, community garden approach. And I've seen this be, uh, be successful in other places and it can be really a center for a community. Next. So as I mentioned, we have about 30 plant species in the garden. Our garden is designed as a demonstration garden. So what we're demonstrating are the plant species that you should consider to plant if you want to achieve the objective of having monarchs and or pollinating plants. <clears throat> of those 30 plant species, oh, and by the way, they're not necessarily in the uh, pattern we might do if our goal was simply to create a uh, beautiful scenic uh, 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 flower garden. We have separated the plant species. And the idea is, is that members of the community can come to the garden and hopefully get inspired to plant something uh, that will be supportive of butterflies and uh, pollinators. And they can walk through the garden and look at these different species and say, oh yeah, I like that one. I like purple flowers. I like tall flowers. I like you know, these sorts of characteristics. And they will then be able to select um, the plants they want and, and go out and find them someplace or uh, buy the seed or, or come to a plant sale. And we'll try to provide uh, both the uh, milkweeds and the pollen and nectar plants. 
Uh, one of the issues that comes up a lot of times is the issue of natives versus non-natives. And we have a few non-native plants in our uh, butterfly garden. Uh, and we do so because they provide a particular niche uh, that we think might be important. And one of them that uh, people have a lot of reaction to is a tropical milkweed. Tropical milkweed is one of the easiest milkweeds to grow, very beautiful, very abundant, and it occurs very early in the season. So we can easily have plants ready at this time of the year. So if the butterflies come, uh, there'll be something for them to, to lay their eggs on. Uh, so we are very much utilitarian in our view. You know, if something works, uh, we're gonna do it. And uh, we're not afraid to incorporate non-natives and uh, we will educate people as we go along and pay attention. If issues arise, uh, we don't anticipate any problems. We've thought about this a great deal. Next slide, please. Almost to the end here. Where are we in the process? Uh, we've uh, selected pretty much the species that we're going to try. Uh, I would predict that next year we will at least a, a quarter of the plants will have to be replaced for one reason or another. Maybe they'll be susceptible to certain insect pests. Maybe they won't grow well. Maybe they will be phenologically out of sync with the butterflies. So we're starting with um, a group of species. And I think there's a slide next that'll tell about how we went through that process. Uh, but we are using a lot of dormant root cutters. Uh, could you go back? Uh, I wasn't quite ready for that. Could you go back one slide? Thank you. So we're planting uh, dormant root bugs, uh, which is that you've got it. There you are. Thank you. Uh, this is actually the best way to plant milkweeds. Uh, we find, however, uh, based upon our sale, you know, people would rather plant something that's in full bloom. Uh, a dormant root plugging uh, plug will is the highest probability of success and. It looks like just yesterday when I was at the garden that almost all of those uh, root plugs we put in, oh, that's over a month ago, are now finally coming up and they look good. So <clears throat> that is a good way to plant it. Uh, but also greenhouse plants, uh, people like to see the green, people like to see the flowers. And so that's, uh, <clears throat> we're, we're gonna be using, we're gonna be planting on Saturday and we're gonna be planting some uh, green plants. Uh, I mentioned the need to replant. We've already replanted several things. It's the normal thing. And then, of course, we hear, we're already trying to manage the weeds and the critters. You know, the, the gophers are there. Uh, we're trying to keep them out. So we, we have a lot of that work to do. Uh, next slide. So what do we need? Uh, well, one thing we really need is some local stable volunteers. Uh, we have several people who have are volunteering. Um, Russ is doing a great job with uh, helping us with the irrigation, but we have a long summer ahead of us. Uh, and we need to have people there to water if we get into what uh, I saw in the Arizona Republic that there is a prediction we're gonna have another really dry summer. So uh, this is a big concern we have now. Of course, we need water. Uh, we're managing now. Uh, we have put in the, the, uh, the tubing and, and so forth for a, a controlled irrigation uh, system, but we need to get uh, connected to some pressurized water. So I'm hoping we'll have a report that this is coming soon. And of course, right now, uh, you know, we are, very much financing uh, the work we're doing. Uh, we do have to rent the greenhouse that we grow our plants in. Um, and, uh, you know, things do cost something. We did cost something to put up our shade house and uh, so forth. So we're, we're trying to figure out a long-term revenue stream. We've written quite a number of proposals. Uh, we do have a small endowment. <coughs> that brings in a little bit of money, uh, but uh, this is something we, and I'm the, I think the garden project overall, 
maybe you guys have discussed this a lot, but there needs to be a long-term idea of where the revenue is going to come to keep all those wonderful things that the garden brings uh, going forward. Is there another slide? I think that might be it. Are, are, are you there? Oh, okay. I want, this is the last slide. So there's one after that. So I took this uh, out of a uh, seed catalog. I'm a very old fashioned guy. About the middle of December, I start getting my seed catalogs at the same time. I start burning wood in the fireplace. So I get up in the morning early, start a fire, have some coffee and read seed catalogs. And uh, I see this picture all the time. <clears throat> this is a picture of a uh, a garden. <clears throat> it's a butterfly garden, or it's just a garden uh, that you may want to uh, create in, in your backyard. Well, what I find so interesting about this picture is that it's very unrealistic about the kind of garden that you're going to see uh, with our <clears throat> butterfly garden. It's unrealistic uh, for one reason is, is that all the plants are blooming at the same time. And um, what we need to create are gardens where you have flowers at very different times. And this is particularly important for the pollinators. We have pollinators and they're different species almost weekly. I see new species occurring in, the gar in my garden. And so what happens is, is you have to have plants that are available throughout the season not just at one time. So having this gorgeous picture looks, uh, is a little unrealistic. And then when you look carefully at this picture, uh, what I see is, is that this isn't a photograph, that is a painting. So someone had to paint those pictures in there to make it have everything look exactly the way it does. So that leads us to uh, the important point about managing expectations. And Heather and I have talked about this on several occasions. Uh, you know, if you can go to the last slide, uh, uh, next slide. There's a, a lag, it's coming. So this is it. This is what the garden looks like right now. So uh, we have to understand that the, the garden will uh, evolve over multiple years. I think in, on May 8th, you'll see a lot more things up. You will see some flowers, uh, but we will still not, probably not even have everything planted. Uh, we, but we should have it looking a little bit different. Right now, you might see a lot of weeds. <clears throat> uh, and the reason why you see that is because uh, some of the plants, are, the plants aren't up yet, then we don't weed because you have a risk of weeding out your plants that you're trying to put there. So we have to let the weeds grow a little bit until our, our target plants get up and then we know where they are and then we can go in and pull the weeds out. So managing expectations, we have to be sure everyone understands that this is not, uh, this is not going to be finished uh, in any short period of time. It's gonna take a while for us to get all the plants established. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk about it. Uh, uh, we can't save milkweeds alone and we have lots of partners who we've been working with. And so uh, we very much appreciate uh, the Rotary Club uh, and their efforts to help work with us. Okay, so Jeanette, that's my story. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll let you manage that. Let you know what, know. I, I want to update you, Mike. Um, David is actually going to meet with the irrigation guy who's going to be putting in the irrigation um, infrastructure. He's meeting with them later this morning. And um, our happy dollars from our month of April, we're going to be giving to your organization, your um, Monarch organization. Um, I do have a question. You talk about pollinators and I usually think bees, but there must be other things that are also pollinators. So help me with that. Oh yeah, there are many, many different pollinators. Uh, interestingly, most people don't re recognize flies are pollinators and a lot of those are doing so primarily as a um, accidental. But uh, I had some uh, uh, 
what was it? Texas Mountain Laurel was bloom is blooming now in my yard. It's spectacular. Brings in lots and lots of pollinators. There's more flies than bees. <laughs> so uh, flies are pollinators. Uh, beetles. There's some beetles that pollinate. Uh, butterflies that pollinate. There are moths that pollinate. So uh, lots and lots of things. Uh, uh, and of course, we do have, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, European honeybee is a very important pollinator, and they are very abundant. And my uh, pollinator garden, they're just tremendous populations. And these are all feral honeybees. I don't think they're coming from commercial uh, uh, beekeepers. And so there's lots and lots of uh, uh, honeybees there. I have a question. I know that like the deer and the javelina eat a lot of vegetation and people have trouble with them with their gardens. Do they eat milkweed? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, it may in fact be the biggest challenge to uh, establishing uh, uh, habitats for monarchs as a deer and javelina. Uh, are both very, very uh, destructive potentially. Uh, the javelina, neither of them eat necessarily uh, uh, milkweed, uh, but they will trample them. Uh, the javelina will, uh, you know, they're rooting around and they'll uproot the entire stand of milkweed looking for grubs or looking for uh, bulbs or other things. And so a lot of the damage is incidental. Uh, so it's not that they're eating them, uh, but that they're just damaging in, uh, in other ways. They do eat some milkweeds, uh, for sure, uh, but we're beginning to learn which ones are, are toxic. And unfortunately, you probably know that there's a part of our community, the ranchers, who are not very supportive of uh, efforts to increase the population of milkweeds because uh, some uh, domestic livestock, in particular sheep, are very susceptible. They can be killed by eating just a single plant of uh, one of our species, uh, Subrichus alata. And uh, uh, that's a species I would like to grow, but that's not very suitable for ranchers. So we have to understand that there are other people who use the land in other ways. But in our communities, uh, in our backyards, uh, we can plant these more toxic species uh, and uh, they will at least not be the first thing the deer eat. But gardening in general is a big challenge here in Arizona because of the critters, pocket gophers, uh, <clears throat> ground squirrels, javelina, rabbits, deer. Uh, my vegetable garden, if I don't protect my vegetable garden, it will be gone in two nights. You know, the deer are really terrible. Uh, you know, just, they'll just take anything. And of course, I'm in a community where nobody else gardens. So it's like a, an oasis for the deer. They just come in and sometimes a whole herd will come in my backyard <laughs> one time. It's a big challenge. Very interesting. I know it, we're, um... oh, did Mike just disappear? <laughs> No, he's there. Oh, he's there. Someone else uh, just. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know people are having to drop off because it's we're past eight thirty. But any other questions for Mike? This is just very interesting what's happening, and we really appreciate that you're part of our community garden, Mike. <laughs> I have a question. Have okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a backyard that is fenced in, and we're going to be. I, we planted some milkweeds from seed and they're real small. Um, is there any way we can still purchase some milkweed? Because I didn't get a chance the other day for our backyards. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Are My you seed. looking for plants or seeds? Is that what you're Plants. Uh, for the milkweed. Plants, yes. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to be having... Uh, uh, we had our sale last Saturday, and uh, we are going to be uh, potting up some of the plants that we didn't sell, and we're growing new plants. So on the May 8th sale, uh, we expect to have even more uh, milkweeds and more other plants available. So we're expecting there'll be a big crowd on 
May 8th, and we're expecting we'll have some things in flower uh, that might, uh, you know, attract more attention on the part of our our customers. And so, yeah, uh, I do want to make last comment, and then I'll let everybody go. But I, I forgot who it was uh, who drove by right after the sale, and he shouted out to me. He said, "Mike, how did you do?" <laughs> and I thought about it for a second, and I thought my first reaction was, "Well, we." we sold this many plants. But then I thought about it and I said, that's the wrong metric. You know, how many plants doesn't matter. And so I didn't respond, but I thought about it. And my response is, we sold enough plants to people in VOC to produce 800 adult monarch butterflies. So that's how we're going to measure our progress. <clears throat> how many butterflies are going to show up in our community if everybody plants the plants that we make available to them? So we produce 800, enough plants to feed 800 uh, milkweeds, and we want to produce enough plants to, uh, which to provide enough plants to produce at least 1,000 on May 8th. So that's our goal. <laughs> that's how we look at it. <laughs> hey, you know what I want to point out to everybody too, that he had a table that was off to the side with all these information sheets about milkweed and everything. And I didn't even see it till um, he mentioned it later. And then I went and looked and it's like, whoa, there's so much information there. So um, if you, you know, when you go back um, on May 8th, you be sure you take a look at that and maybe send people over to look. Yeah, at we'll something. move that around. People didn't look on that side, so we'll put that table somewhere else. Yeah, where people see it, because I, you know, I, I think most people didn't even realize it was there. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Anybody have anything else? Well, uh, we'll be at the garden. You'll see there a lot, so you stop and ask questions anytime you want. So, okay. you see us there. Hey, thank you, Mike, right, so much care. for doing this. Okay, everybody have a great day. <laughs> Yay. Bye-bye. <All right. laughs> Bye-bye.